Nearly 2,000 years ago, in Vietnam, existed an ancient civilization known as the Champa Kingdom. The Chams were the architects of magnificent towers and priceless stone sculptures. Yet little remains of their remarkable culture. A unique collection of these Cham sculptures was lost in a shipwreck off the coast of Africa over 100 years ago. This is the story of these lost treasures of the Champa Kingdom. Chams were the first civilized society to settle in Vietnam nearly 2,000 years ago. The ancient Champa civilization was composed of a loose confederation of individual kingdoms spread throughout the narrow coastal plains of Vietnam. Their greatest and most lasting contribution was in agriculture. The Chams invented the sophisticated system of irrigated rice farming that is still in use today throughout Asia. The people of Champa were rice growers, merchants, exporters, and they were great sailors. Pirates, some of their contemporaries would say. But they were mainly great Builders. The crowning achievements of the Cham architects were their tower sanctuaries, called Kalans. These towers were adorned with exquisite stone statuary. Ancient works of art that reveal much of what we know about this past civilization. Today, little remains of the Cham civilization. Its history lost to the ravages of time, decay, and war. The history of Champa over the last 2,000 years or so is a story full of noise and fury. In clan wars, in palace intrigues, in rebellions, in fratricidal fights, and in dynastic feuds. All upon a fast-moving background of successive capitals, administrative and religious. And through a perpetual renewal of kings and usurpers. Up to the 7th century, they used to build cities and temples in perishable material, mostly wood and palm tree fronds and time and again their capitals were burned to the ground. From the 8th century on, they decided they would start building citadels in durable, solid bricks. The walls of the citadels enclosed magnificent groups of large sanctuaries. The huge towers made of bricks held together with natural resin, mixed with lime, with their stone lintels and door frames, and above all, with their added decorative elements superbly sculpted sandstone statues. All that speaks to us of a very, very great past civilization. The Chams were slowly pushed south by centuries of war with the Viets. Around the year 1000, they came to settle in the Kingdom of Vijaya, which today is known as the Binh Din province of Vietnam. It was here during the next four centuries that the Chams built some of their most elaborate monuments. These towering sanctuaries stood in the midst of a fortified citadel, the center of a Cham community, where thousands of people worked and lived. 
you must imagine once upon a time on all the terraces which are here there was a whole community living hundreds of houses made of wood of course and adobe there's nothing left of them but there the priests were living the servants of the temple and we already had rice paddy fields these kalans were the living center of religious life for the chams such religious buildings were used in the ecumenical religion which was a hard to define and loose mixture of basic animism first, of Shivite Hinduism, and later of Brahmanism, which came to include Buddhism centuries later. Over time, the religion and architecture of the Champa kingdom were shaped by the personal preference and decree of each successive ruler, of which there were many. This is the Gopura of the south side of the fortifications. The Gopuras, or gates, stood in the center of each of the citadel's fortified walls. Inside the wall stood the holy treasury, where the divine offerings and treasures of the kingdom were kept. Facing east was the Mandapa, the place where the faithful congregated to meditate and pray. In the center stood the Kalan, the holy place, the heart of religious and political life in the Champa community. The Kalan was the holy place where the king and his ancestors were honored, which was the whole purpose of building a Kalan. You can just imagine what these majestic towers must have looked like so long ago. The statues, the, the high relief tympanums, the friezes, the angled pieces which decorate their buildings and sanctuaries, were images of their divinities or of holy men or mythical animals, legendary dragons and monsters, or by a number of symbols, water which gives rice, which gives life, or flames for instance, representing the fires of funeral pyre, death and therefore rebirth and a new life. But they also enjoyed decoration for the sake of it, inspired from the leaves, the branches and the flowers of the surrounding nature in their beautiful country. Today, although some of the towers are still standing, very few of the original statues remain. To the ancient people of the Champa Kingdom, these towers places of religious worship were considered sacred. This tower stands in the middle of an active neighborhood in the province of Ben Din. Today, it is used for recreation rather than religious activity. Although the Cham influence on Vietnamese culture has virtually disappeared, in the South, these ancient monuments still serve their communities as places of religious ceremony. Of the 54 distinct ethnic groups that exist in Vietnam today, the direct descendants of the Chams are a small minority and can be found in several remote villages. The little that remains of the ancient Champa people can be found in the faces of their modern day descendants. Their unique features are unmistakably evident in the sculpted images of their ancestors. It is strange how such remarkable people who develop such a highly refined civilization should be so little known today in the Western world. So little is known because so little remains. 
gone are many of the ancient artifacts, carvings, and statues that would reveal much about the history of this ancient civilization. This Kalan has been standing here for about 800 years. All the beautiful carvings, the sandstone statues that were attached to it are gone. We have only empty holes, empty niches. And the question is, where are they? Why are they missing? In early 1992, Stenwee began his quest to unravel the mystery of the missing Cham statues. Renowned as a marine archaeologist, historian, and deep water diver, Stenwee's numerous successes include recoveries of 18 historically significant ancient shipwrecks. His talent for research has been the key to these successful recoveries. In his quest for the Cham statues, he uncovered a series of 19th century documents, authored by this man, Dr. Albert Maurice. Maurice was a French Navy doctor who served in Annam and the French colony of Conchachine. It was here in 1876 that he first saw the art and architecture of the Champa Kingdom. 400 years before the French and Dr. Maurice arrived, all that remained were the brick towers and their stone statues. The sanctuaries had long been abandoned. Their bronze and gilt statues, the priceless offerings to the divinities of the Kalans, had long ago been pierced by the invaders. In 1877, Dr. Maurice visited some of the Cham temples of the Bindin province. By then, they were completely unknown to the Western world, and he was the first to realize their cultural importance. Dr. Maurice was moved by the beauty of the Cham towers and deeply disturbed by their condition. Local villagers had been dismantling the Kalans, mining the ancient bricks to build roads and shelter. In an effort to study and preserve some of the last remaining artifacts of the Cham civilization, he carefully removed a collection of statues and reliefs. Dr. Maurice made two shipments of statues. A small consignment containing 10 pieces arrived safely in France in 1877. These now reside in the Museum of Natural History in Lyon, France. But the larger shipment of 22 boxes containing the most priceless artifacts, was put on a French steamer called the Mekong. The Mekong was an elegant 19th century steamer built for the French company Les Messageries Maritimes. Its itinerary included a tour of the Orient. The six-week trip home included stops in Japan, China, and Saigon. Then across the Indian Ocean to the Horn of Africa, through the Suez Canal and back to France. The Mekong was built for comfort. 180 crew members cared for the needs of just 66 first-class passengers. For the wealthy traveler, the trip home was a long, festive occasion, celebrated with all the amenities of a floating palace. The decor was Napoleon III, complete with gilded statues, stucco garlands, and varnished oak staircases. The cabins, saloons, and smoking rooms resonated with laughter and stories of power and adventure. At midnight, June 17, 1877, the Mekong sailed north along the Horn of Africa. The weather that day had been clear but now, mist from unusually high monsoon surf and thick fog blanketed the coast off the port side. The Mekong made the same mistake that countless others have made over the centuries, navigating the turn at the Horn of Africa. As ships travel north, making an accurate identification of Cape Guardafui is essential to safe passage around the Horn. In poor weather conditions, navigators could easily mistake the southern point at Cape Chenarif to be Cape Guardafui, and the lowlands in between 
to be the open sea. Believing Cape Chenerife to be the turning point, the captain of the Mekong set his course due west. The result was disaster. Two miles south of the Horn of Africa, the ship struck the shallow bottom. There were screams and panic, but in the end, only two people lost their lives. The survivors struggled to shore, while the local Somalis were efficiently looting their luggage and the ship's strongroom of gold bars and other commodities. But the consignment of Cham statues, large sculpted stone blocks, representing divinities of another time, of another civilization, appeared worthless in the eyes of the Somali looters. Within days, the relentless waves would pound the damaged hull into two pieces. The Cham statues would remain undetected for 118 years. Albert Maurice never lived to see again the statues he had worked so hard to preserve. When the news of the sinking of the Mekong reached him, he had been quite ill for some time. He died in France four months after the wreck. He was aged 29. In the 19th century archives of France, Stenwy pieced together the clues that would lead him to the location of the wreck of the Mekong. After four years of painstaking research, Stenwy was finally ready to attempt a recovery. But to succeed, he knew he would need help. Robert is an internationally recognized marine archaeologist. He's had 30 successful recoveries at sea, 15 of which he led. He's the author of 14 books on marine archaeology. Robert has written five feature articles uh, for the National Geographic and many, many scientific papers. He is a pioneer of mixed gas deep diving. Robert made the first ever saturation dive at sea in 1962, and is probably best known for his ability to research in eight different languages. In 1995, Ted Edwards Sr. and his son Ted, the principals of IMSL, International Marine Salvage, agreed to partner with Stenwy to recover the missing Cham statues. IMSL provided Stenwy with the strategic planning and financial resources required to make a recovery. A 167-foot North Sea trawler, the Scorpio, was secured and transformed into a search and recovery vessel. An international team of experts was assembled. The 23-member recovery team included navigators, explosives experts, security personnel, and divers, as well as the ship's crew. The Scorpio would be their home for the three-month duration of the mission. After completing my research, I was quite confident that we could find the wreck of the Mekong. But there were many obstacles ahead of us, obstacles of a different nature. In a word, the real problem was Somalia. In 1991, after seven years of civil war, a central Somalian government ceased to exist. In Somali waters, piracy became commonplace. Six months before the Scorpio's arrival, a report from the UN's official maritime office stated that there were 15 attacks at sea, seven of which involved machine gun fire, leaving 24 dead. This posed a very real threat to the Scorpio. To travel these waters unarmed is to invite disaster. So before the expedition could begin, the team faced a most difficult challenge. To import into Somalia, a country at war, the arms needed for their protection, and the specialized underwater explosives required to penetrate the steel hull of the Mekong. 